Hi guys, my name is Kat Slump. I'm a junior at the University of Nebraska Omaha studying IT innovation and I'm currently an intern at Flywheel, a uh, software engineering intern. So um, I'm going to talk to you guys about what I learned um, while I was in Silicon Valley this January. Um, Square, as a part of their Women in Tech initiative, invites about 22 girls um, for their college code camp every year. Um, they choose 22 across North America, so we were all from different schools um, across uh, the United States, I guess. But um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about what I learned. Oh, sorry. Um, so this is a picture of some of us. Um, five days, 22 women, one life-changing experience. I got to know a lot of these women throughout the time. Um, I was there. A lot of them were from Harvard, Stanford, NYU. There were three girls there from Midwestern schools. I was happy that I wasn't the only one. Um, but yeah. I don't know, I'm just showing you some of the pictures. When we got there, they had these little packs for us. We all got our first square reader, so that was cool before we even got to the company. Um, the first thing we did was we went to San Francisco, or SF Workshop in San Francisco. Um, it's a local startup, and then we made our own t-shirts, so we screen printed our own t-shirts. It was kind of how we got to know everyone. And then um, we had our videographer following us around, Vinny. So Vinny has filmed for House in CSI Miami, and we were like, oh my gosh, he's following us around for the entire week. He is awesome. Um, and he's self-taught too, so that was also really cool to learn about him. So um, our first experience is at Square. Um, for those of you who don't know, Square is the payments, um, the payments reader that hooks into the audio jack of your phone. Um, it's also known for the Square Register. Um, entrepreneurs and businesses all across um, the world use Square to easily make transactions. So um, they don't have to have an actual cash register in front of them. Um, so the story of Square. So Square was started by Jim and Jack. Um, so Jim, the whole thing started where Jim was making these glass faucets. And the problem with these glass faucets were they weren't hundreds of dollars, they were thousands. So um, he was running, he was making these glass faucets and finally almost got his first sale. And the guy was like, well, I don't have thousands of dollars in my pocket, I have my credit card. And so Jim was like, well, I have to come up with a solution for this. Like, I just lost my first customer. Um, he could only pay with a card and basically lost the sale. So he called Jack and um, on February 11, 2009, they uh, joined together and created the idea of a payment system that you could um, plug into your phone. Um, and that started in Mint Plaza, which there's a picture of me in Mint Plaza. The hotel we stayed at was right across the way um, from that. So that was really cool to kind of see where it all started. Um, so the story of Square continued. Initially, they wanted to call it Seashell. Um, that didn't work out, so they went to Squirrel. And I'm not really sure why. They wanted to make the Square Reader an acorn instead of a square. Um, they also, <laughs> yeah, they also uh, said the reason why they want to call it Squirrel is um, the audio that goes through um, when you make a payment on a credit card through an audio jack sounded like a screeching squirrel, which <laughs> I don't know, so they're like, yeah, let's name it this. So they took it to Apple, and Apple was like, no, there's already a payments uh, company in Canada called Squirrel, you can't do that. And they were back to square one, literally. Um, but yeah, the reason why they actually found Square is because Square was one up um, from Squirrel in the dictionary, and they thought it fit the name, or what they were trying to do quite well. Um, a gathering place, uh, somewhere where people would sell goods and, and all of that sort. So. That's where they ended up with. Um, so I thought this was really cool. When you enter Square, one of the first things you'll see is um, this huge map. And in real time, you'll see these bubbles light up on this map. And they're all Square transactions, like at, at time, like real time of when people are using Square all across the United States. So I thought that was a really, really, really neat thing. Um, the four corners of Square, these are their values. Um, so start small. Uh, when we talked to Jack Dorsey, he was all about finding the essentials, that MVP, that thing that you can build upon, and once you perfect that, um, everything else will kind of um, be put into place. So then, <laughs> it's okay, one more. Uh, give it soul, um, let it tell a story, uh, show don't tell, that kind of says 
for itself um, and break the rules. So those were the four, the four, the four corners of Square, they say. Um, make commerce easy, that's Square's uh, kind of motto and um, what they strive to do, and it's on their walls in the building. Um, just trying to make the experience between a seller and the buyer, or yeah, the seller and the buyer completely like just, I don't know, without, without ha like an ease, I guess is the word I should say. Um, but yeah, and then they have the, so on this left side uh, is like the first squares and it's a progression from left to right of the history of it. Um, so it initially was not uh, a square and it wasn't white. Um, they said once they changed it to being a square, um, their sales or their effectiveness went up about 60%. Just the fact that the actual object was square and white. Um, which I found really interesting. You'll also see uh, the frame or the um, the mock-ups of uh, what Jack and Jim wanted the app to initially look like, and they're framed um, the legitimate pieces of paper that they used to to draw out um, their wireframes. Um, these are cool. Uh, they're soundproof, so even though they're not walled in, um, the second you walk in, kind of where she's walking in. Um, the sound, like you almost hear nothing like going on in the company. So that was a really interesting piece of technology, I guess, that they had within Square. Um, they have coffee bars throughout it. Um, yeah, that was awesome. But one thing I really liked about Square is um, even though the company pays for um, their food and, and all of that, they, as uh, employees have to use the square register whenever they get anything from the company so coffee their breakfast lunch and dinner so they're constantly using the product that they're investing all their time in because um, a lot of people i guess you could go without even using your product and for them it's really important that their employees are so town square um this was about three levels up from the actual where i was showing you those pictures this is where they eat um their dining hall basically uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner is all provided. Like I said, they use the square register, um, and the options change daily. There was sushi one day, it was awesome. Um, but yeah, they really wanted to make it a culture where everyone would want to go to work and eat there and stay as long as they could. Um, they had a smoothie bar every morning. You could go and pick up your smoothie. Um, and then this was my favorite part. So every Friday, their um, square had a meeting that included the entire company. So Jack Dorsey would run it, um, or runs it, and it's always at a certain time every Friday, and they talk about everything. They introduce new members, it's very open. Um, one thing that I really appreciated about the company was whenever any meeting happens in Square, someone is taking notes of it and posting it to like the internal system of Square. So no matter who you are, like you can go and check like what someone was talking about in the meeting that happened like 20 minutes ago, or like, you don't even have to be like in the team. You can go and find it wherever you are, basically. Um, we also had the opportunity to go to Twitter, um, probably because Jack Dorsey. But um, yeah, these are just some pictures of inside Twitter. I wasn't expecting it to be like earthy, but it was. Um, that's actually the ceiling right there on the, the left. And this is their entryway. And that's like what you see from the street. Oh, if you go back one. Um, inside. It was really interesting. All of so this is their cafeteria, and all of this uh, like the food segments were sectioned off by hashtags. So it'd be like hashtag meat or hashtag I don't know. So they use their hashtags everywhere, even within the company. Um, this is their patio. It was awesome. Um, they're just a rooftop patio. Uh, we spent some time out here, uh, and then inside as well. They also have a coffee bar, uh, just like Square. And probably the coolest thing about Twitter is they have tweets um, that they feel have made an impact on their walls. So um, I don't know, they're just obviously you guys know Twitter is like um, a huge, I don't know, it gives, gives people a voice when they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, and so that's a huge thing for them. And it was really cool just throughout the company you would see random tweets just lining their walls. Um, it was very cool. And this was all of us um, when we were at Twitter. Um, and then we had a meeting with Jack Dorsey, so he's the co-founder and CEO of Square as well as the co-founder of Twitter. Also had the first tweet in history. Um, his handle is at Jack, so that's cool. Um, we got to sit down with him for about a half hour. We're all fangirling, but yeah. Um, 
the interesting thing that we learned from him is he was always like, reach and I don't know. Um, the second you don't know something is when you're onto something, is what he would say. So always kind of strive for that. Um, as well as passion is not something that can be taught. And simplicity is drive, not design. Do something as easily as possible. Um, he was really about um, the whole, yeah, simplicity aspect, the MVP, making things um, kind of as, as simple as possible um, before like caring what it looked like, I guess. We also did, uh, went through cybersecurity. Um, we used SQL injection to move around um, money in our bank accounts. So we found out if we put a negative number, negative amount of money, it would actually add money to our accounts. So like, we were just trying to find different ways to break it, and it was kind of the inside of cybersecurity. We also did some machine learning. Um, but yeah, we had little workshops. The lightning talks. So out of us 22 girls, um, a few stood up and gave little five-minute um, speeches about something that they'd been doing. Um, Bryn, up on the top left, is actually like the founder of PenApps, which is the largest collegiate hackathon in the United States. So she went through like how she decided to even set this up and how she went through like growing it and. Um, next week, actually, I'll be, in, uh, I'll be at Penn Apps, which is really awesome, in Philadelphia. So it'll be cool to kind of see her work and, and how it unfolded. Uh, Terry in the upright corner, um, she's from NYU, and she created a stock page. It's called BeyonceTrader.com. She did it with her NYU friends. But if you look up a stock, it'll, like, spit back a Beyonce GIF, based, Giphy based off of, like, if it's doing well or not. So if it's doing well, it's like Beyonce like this, or like if it's doing bad, it's like her looking like this. But you can look it up, it's live, um, BeyonceTrader.com. So that was awesome. <laughs> Vicky here on the left, um, yeah, that's her with President Obama. Like a couple weeks after um, we were in, uh, yeah, we were in San Francisco, but she talked about how she made aircraft sensors from the ground up. So that was really, really interesting as well. Um, this is Maria Claus, so she is the president of Harvey Mudd, um, the previous dean of engineering at Princeton, and she talked to us about how um, she took the amount of women in computer science from 10% to 40%. Um, so she gave us our, her insights on, on kind of what she did to, to skew it so more women would be interested in the field. Um, throughout the entire five days, uh, we all split up into groups, and. Uh, it was like basically a hackathon to help this um, group called Children's International. Um, and so we created an app, um, an iOS app, to kind of bridge the gap. So Children's International is basically um, a donor sponsors a child, or a, a, like a, a person sponsors a child um, who, I don't know, is probably going through tough times and um, just needs someone to talk to and, and stuff like that. So. Um, and the sponsor gives money to the child. And so we were kind of bridging that gap and created a timeline. So um, the, uh, uh, gosh, the donor could talk to the, the child more easily and see like what they're doing um, and keep updated on what's going on. And this is Vivian Har. So she was probably my favorite. We got to talk to her on the last day. So at age eight, she became the first American to bottle her own lemonade. Um, and the interesting thing about her is, so she saw a picture of two little boys in slavery when she was about like seven, I think, and that kind of really impacted her. And so she decided to start a lemonade stand that would give um, money to programs that were trying to eradicate slavery. So she bottled her lemonade and to this day has given over $100,000 by doing 5%, I think 5% of her sales going to companies that do eradicate slavery. So though very little, she was with the Dalai Lama and she is probably like one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. So um, she said, you don't have to be bigger, powerful to change the world. It can be just like me, which I loved. But um, the second type, uh, part of my talk, I wanted to talk about um, kind of my realizations um, after being there. Uh, I noticed that the effect of the lack of women in tech seems to be worse in the Midwest, which it, I don't know. I, I realized this when I was talking to some of the girls who are like from Stanford and Harvard and 
Um, when I told them that I was like the only girl in a room of 30 in my computer science classes, they were just like, what? Like, how, how is that even possible? Um, for them, like, the numbers are larger. Like, obviously, there's still a lack of women in tech, but um, because, I don't know, like, smaller class sizes and smaller schools and stuff like that, um, I don't know, we just don't have as many people. Um, so that was really interesting to hear that none of them had really had that experience. Um, and it was more of like the Midwest, Midwestern girls who were saying that as well. Um, but yeah, and the next one. Um, company culture, I think, needs a little bit um, of change. Uh, I'm not saying that we have to be like Google and have those like, I don't even, what are they? Where you like sit in those sleep chambers or something like that. We don't need those. Um, we just need to be aware, I think our companies need to be aware of like, I don't know, culture needs to be a worry for a company. Um, they need to be able to like want to make work somewhere that women want to go work and men as well, like everyone wants to go work. So um, that's something that stuck out. Uh, you can be a leader in tech just by sharing your experiences. I learned that um, through the lightning talks uh, that I listened to girls my age give. I was so inspired by that. Um, and whether you're male or female, I think that's a huge thing um, that you can do. And instigating change may seem difficult, but it's easier than you think. Um, I think that goes to say Vivian Har, um, the little girl that I just um, shared your story about with. Like, um, yeah, like the whole women in tech problem is a thing, but like um, little steps, whether it be you're a parent, you're telling your child about um, opportunities in tech, or um, whether you're like me and you give up, you get up and decide to give a last minute bar camp talk. Um, different things can go and try and make a problem a little bit better. So that is all I have for you today. So anyone have any questions?